Or should I say God has something for you? How about that? God has some. We've been talking about love. We've been talking about relationships. We've been talking about things that love does. It's going to be awesome uh, this week. It's the last week of this. You know, we talked last week about a love that lasts. And we're going to talk this week about a love that lasts. But we're going to talk about because he can, I can. I'm going to say that again. We're going to talk about because he can, that means I can can. How many of you know that there's some people in this world that you just feel like you can't love them? <laughs> you ever met people like that? You ever met people that you're like, man, that is the most hard, negative, grumpy, griping, complaining person I ever been around in my life. I got to get away from them. Ooh, I almost said something there. I ain't going to say it. I ain't going to say it. I ain't going to say it. But unfortunately, most of those people are in church. <laughs> you know I'm telling the truth. You come in church and get your praise on, and on Monday morning, we can't even hardly look at you because the daggers just coming out of your eyes. I've been there, I know. You seen the little picture on Facebook with the baby crying and says, I don't want to go to work. That's almost like every day, isn't it? But if you don't work, the Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't. <laughs> I like to eat. So that means I need to work. I'm going to start off with the same scripture that we've read for several weeks in a row. 1 Corinthians 13. We've been in the love chapter, and I really believe God's trying to tell us something because this is about the fifth or sixth week that we've actually been in 1 Corinthians 13. And I believe God's trying to tell us we need to learn how to love. I'm not just talking about inside of your marital relationship. I'm talking about as an individual, we need to learn how to love. Because this world is filled with enough hate. Turn your news on. All you got to do is turn your news on. Who, who, who is the guy that just hired two fellows to beat him up and say they were... I don't watch this. I don't watch the show Empire. I, I can't. I can't even stand to watch the commercials of that one. But, but the, on the, the guy on the Empire hired the two guys to beat him up and yell some racial slurs. All he's doing is trying to stir stuff up. He's trying to get hatred going. It don't take a lot to get hatred going. But I believe God's telling us as individuals we need to learn how to love because we don't know how to love. I'm not talking about love that you've experienced as a kid, love that you've experienced as an adult. I'm talking about true, unconditional love. That's something that we have a hard time with because we compare love to the things that we know and our experiences. They're giving you handouts. I'm going to get you this and I'm going to fill in. And there's a lot of blanks in there, aren't they? Would you be okay if I didn't fill all those in? <laughs> I wouldn't be okay with it either. <laughs> so even if I don't get through with the message, we're going to fill those blanks in. Love that lasts. Because he can, I can. The Bible says there's nothing impossible with the Lord. You say, well, I can't love that person. Yes, you can. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love protects. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres, and it says love never fails. That's not a real good translation there. Love never fails. The translation should read, love goes on through eternity. That means it's not going to stop. God's going to keep loving you all through eternity. And how long is eternity? Eternity doesn't end. So love is not going to end. So we need to learn 
how to love while we're here. If I can't love you while I'm here, when I get to heaven and see you, <laughs> it ain't like I'm going to be able to act like I'm in Walmart. Oh, oh there's a... I ain't going to be able to do that in heaven. So why don't I learn how to love you? This is a practice session for when we get to heaven. And I want to practice and I want to practice and I want to practice till I get it right. And I believe that's why God sends difficult people in our past. Is he's trying to help us get it right. So love never fails. You may be going preacher. Well, I, 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 that's not been my experience as a kid. I didn't experience that as a kid. My parents were not that loving to me. I don't know how that feels. That's not been my experience as a married person. You know, that the love has just been conditional, and I don't know how that feels. I don't know what this kind of love is, a love that lasts. What are you talking about? In all of my friendships, it's always been conditional. As long as I do what they want to, then they're happy with me. But if I don't do what they want to or agree with what they say, then they get unhappy with me. And I just don't know what this kind of love is, Lord. That's what we deal with on a daily basis. I got a phone right here filled with text messages that has nothing to do with love. We need to learn. I need to learn more about love. Because how do I deal with the difficult people in my life? It ain't like I can cut them out. Because, you know, sometimes that would even be my wife. Oh, you know I'm telling the truth. Your spouse is the same way. Sometimes you're like... Get out of my face. Go somewhere because I ain't dealing with you today. So how do we how do we do that? You're going, preacher, I don't know what kind of love you're talking about that lasts and it never ends. You're like, this is more like your relationship you got. Remember this old song, Love is a Battlefield? Anybody remember that one? I started to get Tanner to play it, but after I looked at some of the lyrics, I'm like, uh, think I need to be I'll just use the title how about that if you want to look it up go home and look it up the video is not that great either um, but sometimes we feel like we're in a battlefield you know why it's because the enemy wants to destroy the love you have in your relationship because he's about disunity and God's about unity. God's about putting you two together and making you become one flesh where Satan is about separating you and telling you to do whatever makes you feel good. And that's pretty much what you hear on the news all the time. It's hard to discover a love that lasts because we live in a world of selfishness. We live in a world of selfishness because all we do and most all of the decisions we make are based on I and not on us or we. So it's very hard to find this kind of love. The world says, follow your heart. It, right? The world says, follow your heart. Follow your heart. All you got to do is follow your heart. You can't go wrong. Well, that's contrary to what the Bible says. Because in Matthew 15, 19, it says, from the heart comes every kind of evil. Don't follow your heart. Follow God. Your heart's going to lead you astray. Your heart's going to cause you to sin. Your heart's going to cause you to lust. Your heart's going to cause you to, 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 to cheat on your spouse. Your heart's going to cause you to spend where you don't have. Your heart's going to cause you to do all kinds of selfish things. But God is going to look out for your best interest. Because he knows what you need before you even know what you need. The world says... I need to do what makes me feel good. I need to. I need to just. I need to just do whatever. I just can't deal with that. And there's been a lot of times that I didn't feel like I can deal. But you know what you do? 
You pull up your big boy pants, you tighten up your belt, and you say, Lord, I can't deal with this, but I know you can. And my Bible says, through Christ Jesus, I can do all things and nothing is impossible if I trust in God. So let's pull up them pants and let's go. But most of the time, the world is teaching us to tuck tail and run. You don't have to stay married. Go get you a divorce. You don't have to stay in that relationship. Get out. Get you a prenuptial agreement before you get married. That, that, that's, that's a formula for failure to start with. You're looking to fail. God says when you get married, you're supposed to be together until death do you part. What God has put together, let no man separate. We need to, we need to, we need to have a love that last. And the only way I can have a love that lasts is if I put Jesus at the center. I got to put Jesus at the center. And it starts with me individually. It starts with you individually. Then it moves into you as a couple. Then it moves into you as a family. Then it moves into you as your job or business, whatever you have. And then it just keeps trickling on down the line. See, but the problem is, as Jesus is at the center, I put myself at the center. And when I put myself at the center, love is not going to last because I'm going to look across the fence and I think that grass is greener over there. Look at that grass over there. Man, I'd be looking good. Like I know you should. <laughs> well, when's the last time you looked at your yard? You probably got weeds in there because you ain't done nothing in your yard in a while. You need to get the rake and start raking it and tending to it and put a little work in your yard and it'll look just as good as that yard over there. Because I guarantee you, when you get to that green yard over there, it's not going to be green long and it's going to have just as many bushes and pine cones and straw laying all over it as the yard you just left. And then you're going to be going, what in the world did I do? Let me go back over here. Galatians 2.20 says this. This is Paul talking to the Galatians. We've got to put Christ at the center. This is what Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. He said, I have, been, I have died with Christ. Me, myself, I died with Christ. My wants, my desires, everything that I wanted for my life died with the crucifixion of Christ. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live. In the flesh. I live by the faith in the son of God. Which loved me and gave himself. Paul is going. I may be alive in the flesh. But my flesh died when Christ died. I become dead when the crucifixion of Jesus. When I accepted him, the old me had to die. He says, now that I'm living, I'm living for Jesus Christ. It is through him I live. My flesh does not have its own desires. I have the desires of Jesus and what he wanted. Jesus gave himself for me, so why can't I give myself to him? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Jesus gave himself for me, so why can't I give myself to him? Because he says, if you give your life to me, I'll make sure you have everything you've ever needed. And I'll bless you beyond your imagination. But he says there's some stipulations on it. You've got to follow my commands. You know what that means? You got to follow his instructions. I had a class when I worked at Savannah River Plant. And this was the this was the title of the class. Start a task, finish a task. I'm like, that's stupid. I'm like, 
Why am I going to a class to learn how to start something and end something? I know now. I got a project in my bathroom that's been undone for about 15 years. <laughs> oh, I need to go back to that class. I started it. I just didn't finish it. And that's the way we do with Jesus a lot of times. We'll start and we'll be going great. And all of a sudden life hits. And we bail out on him. And we're going, I ain't got to take this. You're exactly right. You don't have to take it. You don't have to do it. And he's not going to force you. God will never force himself on you. He wants you to do it because he loves you. A real relationship. A real love. How about this foundational verse that we read in, in Psalms 127.1? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Who build it? What are you building? What are you building? Are you building a house that's going to last through the storms? Or are you building a house that's going to fall when the storm comes? And the way you know that is by the foundation in which you're building the house on. If you're building a house on a sturdy foundation, on the rock as Jesus called it, then when the winds come and the rains come and, and everything's blowing and everything's reeling and rocking and you hear the sound of the wind going by the windows, your house is still going to be standing when it's over with. But if you've got a rickety, sandy foundation that you put that house on, when the winds come and the rains fall, your foundation is going out from under you and your house is going to fall. And it says, then great. Was the fall of that house. What are you. What are you building. Who's building it. Unless the Lord builds the house. They labor in vain. Can I make a bold statement here. I don't want to build a church on that property. Unless God's going to help build it for us. Because I don't want to fall in the percentage of churches in the United States that close their doors after five years. Because it's a very high percentage of churches that after they get in their building, the things go great and then all of a sudden they hit hard times and they go down and they have to close their doors. I don't want to do that. The way I understand that, if God is building it, it's going to stand the test of time. So if we're not going to allow him to help build it, let's just stay here. Yeah, I'm, I'm tired of setting up tear down just like everybody else. We've been doing it for eight and a half, almost nine years now. And that's a lot of set up, tear down. That's a lot of sweat, equity in there. A lot of things going on. And I'm ready for a church building. But if God's not going to build it, it's not going to do us any good. We got to have a love that lasts. And this community's got to see us loving them. I can love them before I get out there. So why, why aren't we doing it? What kind of house are we building? If you build your house on the love and the foundation of Jesus, it's going to stand. I don't care how loud Satan roars and how much nasty breath comes out of his mouth. He can huff and puff and blow all he wants to, but the house won't come down. And we need the Lord to build a house. Let me give you four pillars for, uh, of, of life for marriage. Four pillars of life for marriage. Let me give you these. Very simple. And you're going to think, well, that sounds really stupid. But once you read over these a few times, you'll, you'll really grab those. Number one, you, can tr you can't truly love. That's the first blank. You can't truly love until you have received the love of God. You see, people that come out of broken homes have a hard time receiving the love of God. People that come out of homes where they've been abused by their parents have a hard time of receiving the love of God. Because they base their love on what their parents have done to them. God is not an abuser. He will never mistreat you. He will discipline you. But he'll never mistreat you. He'll love you always. So you can't truly love until you have received the love of God. Number two, you can't truly live 
until you have allowed Jesus to live through you. Because you really don't know what life is if you've never allowed Jesus to live through you. Because all the other you've been doing, it, all you're doing is selfishness. Me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. And it has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with love. It has everything to do with my life. Leave me alone. I'm the one doing it. I ain't hurting nobody but myself. That's a lie straight from the devil. You're hurting everybody around you. Got quiet in here. Well, preacher, I can act the way I want to act. No, you can't. Because you're affecting everybody around you. You ever heard the terminology, one bad apple spoils the? You know what you need to do with the bad apple? Did we just say that in church? Do I need to break that down or are we good? <laughs> I know at home, And I don't keep many potatoes at the house, but if, if I got a bag of potatoes at home and I go to get some out and there's one bad one in there, I pull that bad one out. And if I can save it, I save it. If I can't, I throw it in the trash. So if we've got somebody in our life that is corrupting us, and that's what the bad apple does is corrupt everything else around it. So don't sit here and tell me I ain't hurting nobody but myself. You're hurting everybody around you. I did the same thing. I'm like, oh, you ain't going to affect nobody but me. Lie, lie, lie. That's what the devil wants you to believe. And he wants you to continue on the same road. Number three, you can't truly forgive until you've been forgiven. We can't truly forgive until we've been. You see, if I've experienced the forgiveness of God for my sins, how much more should I extend forgiveness to those who've wronged me? Hmm? But do we do that? I've been forgiven of my sins. <laughs> what, did, what, what did the king do? The, King forgave the servant who owed him money. He said, I'm just going to forgive you and write it off. So the servant goes out and he finds one of the guys that owes him money and he jacks him up against the wall and says, hey, you're going to give me my money now or you throw it in jail. And he goes, but I ain't got nothing to give you. So he had him throw it in jail. So they went and told the king that, yeah, hey, you were merciful on this guy, but he ain't very merciful over here with somebody that owes him. So what did the king do? He went back and he taught him a lesson. I've received forgiveness of my sin. If you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart and life and asked him to forgive you and truly repented, meaning you've said, I'm sorry, Lord, and you turned and went the other way, you've got Jesus living in your heart. And I need to extend forgiveness to everyone else around me. Because after that point, we go to Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, where it says, If you don't forgive those who have sinned against you, your Father in heaven is not going to forgive you of your sin. That's hard, isn't it? Here's why a lot of people are going around in turmoil and confusion. It's because they're holding unforgiveness in their heart, thinking their sins are forgiven when they actually aren't, and they're carrying the weight of their own sins. And so their life is miserable, and they're making everybody else's life miserable when all they got to do is forgive the person that done them wrong, and then God will forgive them of their sins, and they'll be lightened of all this junk that they're carrying around with them. You say, preacher, you just don't know what they did to me. I've had, I've had, I had my best friend. This has been over 20 years. I had my best friend to go to my bishop and ask them 
to get me excommunicated, not just from the church, but from the denomination. Just because we had a disagreement. A preacher, you, you just don't, un- don't tell me I don't understand. I walked with unforgiveness in my heart for two years because of that. But whose choice was it to forgive or not to forgive? Whose choice? It's my choice. Wasn't hurting them. They probably didn't even think about it. It was hurting me. And so finally, after two years, a light bulb, I had a light bulb moment sitting in a conference, and I cried my eyes out, and I said, God, please help me to forgive. And instantly, the weight lifted off of me. I walked out of that conference, and guess who's walking in the door? And he walks up to me, and he goes, hey, man, I just want to let you know that I'm real sorry for all that stuff I did. I'm like, my flesh was like, I'm going to punch you in the face. Snap your neck. Throw you on the floor and just walk off. That was what my flesh wanted to do. But God taught me a lesson on forgiveness. And I forgave him. And I got free from my own sin. Because I was carrying around all that sin that God hadn't forgiven me of because I had unforgiveness in my heart. And his love will last. Because he can forgive me, I can forgive others. Come on, somebody. We need to, we need to, we need to learn that. Because he can forgive me, I can forgive others. We need to, we need to learn that. This one is very important, number four. You can't truly lead a family if you're not planted in the family of God. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying you need a church family. How are you going to know what family is if you're not planted in the family of God? Because God is the one that designed the family. And if he designed the family, what better way to learn how to lead a family than being in the family that he designed. So you can't lead your family effectively until you are planted, plugged in, participating in the family or the church of God. Preacher, I don't need to go to church to go to heaven. No, you don't need a church to go to heaven, but you do need a church to help you grow. And you need a church to help you pray because you're going to run against things you can't handle and you're going to need an Aaron and her to come up beside you and lift your arms up when you get tired. And if you ain't planted in the family of God, where are you going to find that? You're not. The preacher, you said I need to be plugged in. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. You need to be plugged in. Not just attending on Sundays. You need to be working, plugged in, active part of the family. Inactive means you're what? If you're not moving, you're, you're what? You're dead. I can, get in, I can get in my recliner. I tell my wife all the time, I said, I think there are demons in that recliner because that thing grabs me, man, and that thing holds me down. I can kick my feet and move, and I still can't get out of that thing. Well, I ain't dead yet. Still moving a little bit. But sometimes we come in church and we just don't want to move at all. We got to get planted. We got to get grounded in the family of God. Because God created you with a purpose and how you're going to fulfill the purpose if you're not planted in the family. You can't fulfill that purpose on your own. You need people to help you fulfill that purpose. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help us all. I'm not, I'm not fussing at you. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just giving you straight truths and trying to tell you God is trying to teach us something here. 
Because if he can teach us something here, when we get out there, we're going to be a whole lot better off. We're going to be ahead of the game when we get out there. So he's trying to teach us something. Every time I have preached on revealing something the enemy has been using against God's children, he comes against me like a storm. I want you to understand that when I preach something up here, i got to walk through it. People don't understand that. But when a pastor stands up here and gives a message, he walks through the message. Satan's going to make sure that he walks through the message. He's going to say, hey, you spoke it now. I'm going to see if you're going to live it. So I have to walk through this stuff day in and day out. Am I going to be able to forgive? Am I not going to be able to forgive? Because he's going to send people my way that's going to lie on me, backstab me, betray me, and do all kind of stuff. But I still got to forgive even though my flesh says, get out of my face. Oh, am I, am I being too realistic? Uh, I I've always, I don't want to use the word pride, but I've always tried to be the same person no matter where I'm at. I don't care if I'm up here or whether I'm in Walmart. I always try to be the same person. I'll tell you in Walmart what I think just as quick as I'll tell you from up here what I think. I'll call you up on the phone if the Lord gives me a word for you. I'll send you a message. I have sent people messages that started out I feel like the Lord wants me to give this message to you, but it's not a pleasant one. And you know why? It's because I love you. I know he has a better life for all of us than what we're living. I don't believe he wants us to continue to be weighed down by the pressures of the enemy. Because Satan will crush us if he can. I believe. He says, I'm a friend that will stick closer to you than your own brother will. He says, I'm sitting at the right hand of the father and I'm praying for you right now. He said, I'll walk with you through every situation that you have come up in your life. We got to get plugged in to the family. Here's three decisions. How do I get a love that lasts? How do I get a love that lasts? Lord, I don't know how to get a love that lasts. Here's three decisions that you can make that will help you have a love that lasts. Three decisions. You got to invite Jesus into all. You got to invite Jesus into everything. You got to invite Jesus into your life. You got to invite Jesus even into the secret room that you don't want him to go in. Come on, somebody. We all have those little rooms sometimes. We're like, Lord, you can come here, but don't you open that door. I don't want to deal with that. I pushed that in that room and I packed it in there and I closed that door and I put padlocks on that. God, don't you open that door up. You cannot have access to that room, Lord. You can have access to everything else, but uh uh, no, no. No unauthorized entry. Guess what door Jesus is standing at? I can, I can, I can take you to Revelation 3 verse 20 where it says, I stand at the door. He's standing at that door that you've got in your life that says, don't enter. Unauthorized entry is not approved. He's standing at that door and he's knocking on it and he's going, I want to get in there because I know what's in there. I can help you clean that closet out. I can help bring light into that dark place in your life. I can remove all that pain out of there. I can help you get rid of everything. I can even help you with the unforgiveness and the anger and the resentment that you're holding in this room. Let 
Let me in. You got to invite him in to every aspect of your life. And that includes your family. That includes your spouse. That includes your children. You can't hold anything back. You see, Jesus' first miracle was performed where? At a wedding. Jesus' first miracle was performed at a wedding. Jesus and his disciples got there and they were at the reception and they were drinking the wine and then Jesus' mother noticed that the wedding was about to be a disaster because they were about to run out of wine. They were about to run out of the drink and all of the guests were there and they were having a good time. And back then, if you run out of wine, your wedding was a disaster after that because you become the talk of the town. Oh, I can't believe I didn't have enough for us. And you were ostracized. And Jesus' mother went to him and said, Jesus, you got to do something. He said, they got all these guests at this wedding. I don't want this wedding to be ruined. They don't need that kind of start to their marriage. They need you to do something. And Jesus was like, huh? Whoa. He hadn't done a miracle yet. Hadn't done anything yet. And he's like, right, what, what's this got to do with me? And she looked at the service and she goes, hey, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Sometimes we need to listen to mama because even Jesus did. I know teenagers don't want to hear that, but you need to listen to mama. You ever heard that old saying, mama knows best? So Jesus turned the water into wine. and Their marriage was off to a great start because they invited him in. I've done one wedding in my lifetime that they asked me to put this into the wedding at the beginning. I can't remember the exact wording, but it went something like this. We're gathered here to witness the union of whoever and whoever and before we go any further, Jesus, we want to invite you to the center of this wedding. Done one. I've had one couple to ask that. That couple was off to a great start. Number two. Second decision. It'll help you discover a love that lasts. Because you got to work on your marriage. <laughs> we just talked about that, didn't we? I'm preaching my marriage isn't working. Well, how much you're working on it? You know, there was times in my life when I didn't think my marriage was working either, but it's because I wasn't working on it. I felt like I had a good marriage. I'm like, what do I need to go to a marriage conference for? Are you crazy? We got something good, right? <laughs> And my wife's going. And I'm like, what? I was clueless. Men, we're clueless sometimes. And ladies, men, we're clueless sometimes. I didn't feel like I needed anything. I thought we were having a great relationship. But we hit a rocky spot. You know, I talked about it last week between year five and year ten. You know, you, they talk about the seven-year itch and it was rough. And think we was going to make it. Matter of fact, that's when we started throwing the divorce word around. And I wish somebody had told me up front that if never throw that word around. Because when you start throwing that word around, man, the enemy takes that thing and he does all kind of stuff to it. Because he knows in your mind that's a possible option. But when you take that out as an option, he can't work with it. I wish somebody had told me that between year five and year 10. Because my wife and I was arguing all the time and I was looking at her going, you keep on. I ain't got to put up with this. We're going to be divorced for long. You keep running your mouth. And she goes, you keep running your mouth. I don't get out. (laughs) 
I admire those couples who say they've never had a harsh word with each other. I admire them because I was too hard-headed. I was too hard-headed. I was too selfish. I didn't work on my marriage. But finally, when God opened my eyes and I realized I needed to work on my marriage, I began to see my marriage work. You see, the grass got green in my yard. And I admired my yard instead of looking out there at somebody else's yard. There was this young newlywed man. He was talking to a, an older gentleman that married for years and years and years. And this newlywed, you know how excited newlyweds are. They get all excited. Oh! man this is awesome he told the older man he said man he said marriage is so easy it's great it's easy marriage is a piece of cake and he just goes on and on and the old man's just sitting there listening to him and he's just talking about how easy it's a piece of cake and then he makes the statement he said man marriage is a walk in the park and the old man after he took a break the old man looked at him and said son you got that right it's a walk in the park he said but sometimes that park's called Jurassic Park <laughs> I don't know about you but sometimes at my house it's been Jurassic Park me snipping at her and her snipping at me But does it have to be like that? It don't have to be. Here's some tools for you. I, got, I, I call it tools for romance, but it's, it's tools for really anything to help your relationship. The first one, A, I want you to see, is called be available. That be available means your time. Your spouse wants some of your time. They want you to be available. I didn't give that in my early years of marriage. I was fishing. I was deer hunting. I was rabbit hunting. I was fishing. I was deer hunting. I was rabbit hunting. I was dove hunting. I was fishing. I wasn't available. Not that I worked all that much because I didn't work any overtime. I'm like, I'm going to put my eight hours in get me out of here. B, you got to be attentive. Man, that means sometimes you have to look at your wife and go, really? And they did what after you told them that? You have to be attentive. You have to be interested in what they're saying. Not sleeping. Not tune them out while you watch TV. I've been caught in that one, by the way. I'm watching TV. My wife's sitting there. She's talking to me. And I'm looking at TV. She goes, you hear me? I said, yeah. She goes, then what did I say? I went, could you say that again? <laughs> we got to be attentive. You also got to be aware of what's going on. You can't live with your head in the sand. Be aware when your wife is happy and when your wife is unhappy or when your husband is happy or when he's unhappy. You got to be aware of things. You got to be as a parent. You got to be aware so that both of you can get on the same page because your children will play you against each other, and they'll even lie to you and go, "Well, Daddy told me I could," <laughs> and you know, and good and well, your husband didn't tell your child that they could do that. So you got to be aware of what's going on. How about this one? You got to be affectionate. And we talked about it. If you want fire in your romance, then you have to put wood in the fire. You have to put some fuel there so that you can have some fire. It's just not going to, you're not going to come home smelling like stinky work and pull your clothes off and go, hey, baby, let's do it. It ain't going to happen. You got to be appreciative. Sometimes we need to look at our spouse and go, Thank you for washing my nasty, grimy clothes, folding them, and putting them in the dresser. Thank you for putting my supper on the table and cleaning the dishes while I go sit in that recliner. Thank you. 
that you took my car and had the oil changed in it and got it cleaned up. Thank you that you keep the yard clean. Thank you that you have the ability to fix just about anything that tears up. Thank you that you go to work and pay our bills. We've got to be appreciative sometimes. We can't just expect them to do that for us just because we're married. Um, in my younger years, I tried to model my father. In my father's world, there is women's work and men's work when it comes to the house. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I tell him this all the time. I say, you know mama's got you spoiled. He can do, he just don't. Now that mama's got just a little bit better and she's able to get around and she can do some of I've watched him. He's reverted back to his old getting up from the table, going, sitting in there watching TV, and not getting up, cleaning the table up and helping with the dishes and go. He's reverted back. But we got to be appreciative some of us. I, I guarantee you if my dad looked at my mom and said, I know I've never said this, but I am so thankful that you keep this house so clean. I bet that would make my mom's day. Got to be appreciative. And then we also, we have to be aggressive. We have to be intentional with what we're doing. We've got to go after it. If you want your marriage to succeed, you've got to go after it. If you want romance back in your marriage, you've got to go after it. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to find out what works. You've got to try some new things. I ain't talking about no kinky stuff either. But if you work on your marriage, your marriage will work. If you work on any relationship, it doesn't have to be a marriage. If you work on any relationship, it will work. But guess what? It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. They've got to put in 100% and you've got to put in 100%. So you've got to be aggressive on it. Number three, this is the decision. You've got to get right with your maker you'll draw closer to your mate. If you get right with your maker, you will draw closer to your mate. I talk about this in premarital counseling. When I do premarital counseling, a lot of times I'll draw a triangle on a piece of paper. And the triangle will actually be upside, uh, will be upside down. And then I talk about a few things and I flip the triangle back up. And I talk about a few things, and I put, I put one, one of them's name on one side of the triangle, one of them's name on the other side of the triangle at the bottom corner, and then I put God at the top triangle. And I'll ask them this question. This is what I asked him. I said, what happens when each of you individually get closer to God? What happens to you as a couple? When you go up that triangle, what happens? As a couple, you become closer and closer, and clo as long as you got God, and you're going up the triangle, you're getting closer to each other. And that's what you have to do. We can get the band to go on and come back. But you see, we have to make it right with our maker. You see, God is my redeemer. God is my savior. He is my healer. He is my provider. He is my friend. But there's one thing he's not. He is not my exchanger. He is not going to exchange my life for somebody else's. So you can't have somebody else's life and you can't be somebody else. You can only be who God created you to be and you need to be that person. You've got to make it right with your maker if you want to get closer to your mate. I 
I've, I've told you the story while they're getting ready and starting to play. I told you the story about the deer club that I joined. I had no clue why I even joined the deer club because I ain't joined one in umpteen dozen years. And I joined this deer club, made friends with this guy named Stephen. He, I was talking with him again the other night. Man, I get so excited. And God opened doors for him. He's playing the drums. He's involved in church. His wife, was. she didn't really know anything about their going to Church of God. She didn't know anything about the, the Pentecostal movement and the raising hands and the, and the amen and the, and the shouting. And she don't really know a whole lot about that. But he was telling me, he said, he said I, as a kid, I kind of, you know, my grandparents kind of took me and I knew a little bit about it. He said, but we're in this Church of God. And he said, I'm up there playing drums. And man, and he said, the Holy Spirit's moving. He said, now look up. And he said, my wife's got her hands up in the air. <laughs> and I'm like, that's awesome. He goes, he goes, I experienced that as a kid. And he said, now that I'm an adult and I have a wife and kids, he said, it's different. He said, when I see her getting blessed, it blesses me. I said, well, man, how are the kids doing? He said, man, they're loving it. He said, they're making so many new friends. And they're loving church. And this is what he sent me the other day. He always sends me some of the songs that they're going to play on Sunday morning. He sends me some of the songs because he's always wanting to know if I know these songs. And, and I'll tell him, yeah, I know that song. And he sent me the song the other day. And this is what he said. He said, we need a reign of the Holy Spirit. And I said, yes, we do. I said, it's raining on the outside, and we need some rain of the Holy Spirit on the inside. And this is what he said. He said, man, I am so hungry to see God move. And I'm like, God, give us all that hunger and that excitement to see you move in the church. And I know that's why I joined this club is to be able to befriend this guy, talk to him about church, help him take that step that the Lord opened the door for him, recommit his life to Christ and his family's having a blast. And this is what he tells me the other day and I'm like, I don't know how I can do this. He goes, man, I need you to join the club again. I'm like, I don't know, Stephen. He said, man, he said, he said, man, I really need you to join. I don't know what I'm going to do. But I know it cost me $550 for the membership. And then it cost me some corn that I put out up there. And I might have went hunting four times after mom got sick. then I look at it from an eternal perspective and I'm going, God, what is $550 to this man and his whole family coming to the kingdom? This is what he said. He goes, hey man. He's texting me. He goes, hey man. You got to put some of your sermons online. I need some. That's what he, he just texted me that Friday. I think it was Friday he texted me that. He, and we just talked about this Thursday. And he goes, man, you need to put some sermons on. I need some. He's experiencing that love that God's trying to teach us. Today is decision day. Did you know that? Today is decision day. Every time you come into a church and a pastor gives an altar call, it's decision day. You got a decision to make. Are you going to turn around and walk out on the Lord and reject him again? Or are you going to invite him into every aspect of your life? It's decision day.
We're going to have an altar ministry today. And we're going to have Kelly and Denise on one side. And then Shay and myself are going to be on the other side. And we're going to start doing what we've been talking about with the altar ministry so you don't have to stand in line so long. But I want you to know and understand the Holy Spirit that's in here is also in there. You have the same power that I do. The preacher, you're different. You're, you're different. Yeah, I'm different because I got different giftings than you do, but you have the same power that I do. And you have the same power that anybody else prays for you up here. What's it going to be? This is decision day. What's it going to be? You're going to invite Jesus in to every aspect of your life? Or are you going to keep going? And going and going and thinking you're the energizer bunny and run down and fall on your face. Because you see, God's still going to be there when you fall on your face and go, I can't do it anymore. And God's, God's not going to look at you and go, if you just gave your heart to me 10 years ago, you wouldn't be laying down here like this. That's not the God we serve. He's just going to reach down. He's going to love on you. And he's going to let you know he's there. But you have to invite him into every aspect of your life. You got to work on your relationship, not just with your spouse, but you got to work on your relationship with God. You got to make it right with your maker so that you can get closer to your mate. I'm going to ask if Kelly and Denise would come. Miss Shay, if you would come, I'm going to get down there with her. They're going to sing. This is decision day. You say, preacher, I'm already a Christian. Yeah, but have you invited him into every aspect of your life? Every. Not, not, not just, Lord, save me so that I don't go to hell. But every aspect of your life. Because this is when you will truly learn to have a love that lasts. Come down while they're praying.